So um, let's start this way. So it's, it's, it's 6 o'clock. Um, <laughs> on a Friday. On a Friday. Let's pretend we're all at happy hour. Okay. <laughs> and we've already had a couple of beers, and you need to explain Sprinkler to us. Okay. <laughs> so, cause, because I think it's a good place to start, is just what is Sprinkler, you know, in a way we can understand after a couple of beers. <laughs> well, if I'm, uh, let's pretend I'm drunk and someone asks me, can you explain Sprinkler? And I'm like, if you don't know already, you probably don't need to. <laughs> uh, what Sprinkler does uh, social media management for very large businesses. Uh, when you go to Facebook and you're talking about a brand, let's say you, you're talking about your new sneakers or you're complaining about um, the service from your phone company, uh, you are expecting the brand to pick that up, mm -hmm. act on it, and respond to you. All that is done typically through a product or platform like ours. Mm -hmm. And, and who, are your, who are your customers and why do they like to work with you? So we are the most comprehensive social media platform for large businesses. From day one, we focused on very large global companies. Mm -hmm. And that focus has really allowed us to build a complete set of capabilities um, and that make us very attractive for our tar target audience. So our clients are, and I gotta be careful not to get in trouble <laughs> for mentioning brands that I'm not supposed to. We, we work with about 1,300 large global brands. Um, if you think about most categories, we work with most, if not all, of the leaders in, in those categories. So these are companies like Microsoft and SAP and Verizon and Samsung and Nike and um, three of the top five retailers, four of the top five um, telecom companies, mm -hmm. six of the top seven, I think, banks. Yeah, um, that's pretty cool. Large global implementations. I see. And, and, you're, and the last number that I saw was up to around 1,100 employees, something like that? Yep, 1,100 okay. employees. So we're talking about, you know, and worth you know, one of the unicorns? We are, we are, uh, although valuation is always in the eye of the beholder. Right, right, as, as we're finding out this year, I think, right? <laughs> yeah, so when you started Sprinkler, you self-funded. I did. Um, tell me about the decision to you know, self-fund versus getting venture capital, when, when it was the right time to get investors. Well, I don't know whether my model is very scalable or whether you would even want to do it, but... <laughs> Here's, here's what was going through my head, right? And we had an exit before. So my choice was, what was going through my head is this. A, if this becomes wildly successful, then I get to keep more of the benefits, and which is a mistake we had make, made with one of my in my previous lives. And if it goes wrong, I was more comfortable losing my money than someone else's. So I'm like, I couldn't face that guy <laughs> whose money I lost. Uh -huh. So I'm like, I'm going to win either way. Uh -huh. So I'm going to self-fund it. And, and that's why I took the risk myself. And that really allowed us to, and me, to really uh, bring people that bought into that vision um, as investors, as employees, and it worked out well. Okay. I'm, a, I'm an accidental entrepreneur, so I did not... I love to say that I, 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 I had no background in business. My family had no business background whatsoever. In fact, my parents would look down on anyone that did business. <laughs> and they what, were like- what, what did they do? Uh, my dad was a professor and my mother worked for the government. Okay. Um, so it was, you know, become a doctor, become an engineer, do something. Mm -hmm. Because business was evil. <laughs> but you made money in business by cheating others. <laughs> um, and, and so that was not a great uh, environment uh, to, to have entrepreneurial ideas. Um, I was, uh, I, my undergrad was in computer science engineering, so I started out as a programmer. Um, I have this massive fear of failure. Um, <laughs> That's not very good for an entrepreneur. It's actually very good for is it? <laughs> it is, okay. <laughs> so that just gives you insane strength when things go wrong. I guess that's true. Um, and I, uh, during the dot-com time, I ended up uh, with, a, with a company that went bust, and we started spinning out companies' ideas off it. Mm -hmm. And that became my first and 
led to my second and led to my third and led to my fourth mm -hmm. startups. Um, growing up, and this is, this is what probably you're referring to, growing up, my parents lived in uh, Nigeria for a bit. Um, and so during my formative years, I ended up not going to school for three years mm -hmm. and um, were, traveling were, around. Were you homeschooled or you just didn't go to school? Uh, just did not go to school. <laughs> And uh, I didn't think that was a, a big deal because my parents, uh, when we came back to India, uh, put me in a boarding school and said, oh, you skip second, third, and fourth. Well, you should be in fifth grade. And, so <laughs> and you just push pick, me there. And just pick it up. And it was a boarding school. And, yeah. and I, those were, you know, looking back, it was a nightmare to be there at that time. But it kind of gave me a different perspective about uh, life and what's right and what's wrong and how to face problems on your own. And you know, I spent a couple of years in the boarding school, came back, did high school, um, and not having a normal family, school, stable environment just gave me uh, uh, the perspective of just thinking about what's right and what's wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and I went to a Catholic boarding school so that uh, my, they gave me a very deep-rooted spiritual way to think about things. And, and so to this date, I, one of the things I'm very proud of and I think I'm happy about is, you know, I walk around with a, what I refer to as an internal moral compass. Um, that just always tells me what's right and what's wrong. And over the years, I've found the strength and courage to believe in what I like to do and just go out and do it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but can, is, can you think of a particular story in business where that sort of spiritual centeredness really, you know, made a, dis a difference in, in the decision you made or, or the, you know, the path you, you chose? Um, well, I can. I, I don't think I've mentioned this before, but when I started Sprinkler, um, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd sold our previous startup in 05 for a decent amount of money. Um, so a lot of lessons learned from there. I was the CTO of the startup. Mm -hmm. So I learned a lot of things that should never be repeated in my next startup. <laughs> um, and so when I started Sprinkler, um, it allowed me to start from a place of strength. Um, um, I didn't have, I checked many of the boxes I wanted to check uh, in terms of sort of basic financial security um, and accomplishments in life. So starting Sprinkler was, was a beautiful process. And, and I started Sprinkler with two promises to myself. Um, the first one was, um, I will never be taken hostage. <laughs> Explain that. Yeah, I will. And the <laughs> second one was, I will refuse to work with assholes. <laughs> and, and that's something that um, has been tested many times. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's, it, it's just having that conviction just helped me out. I was, you know, there was one time when someone I was involved with um, and was very kind to, um, as the company shot to fame and um, grew rapidly, just decided to turn around and blackmail me saying, hey, listen, you know, I, I can just ruin your company. Um, it's just complete, completely fabricated story. Mm -hmm. But he was like, you're gonna make a lot of money. Why don't you just pay me off? Uh -huh. And those are things where well, it was easy for me to, to cut a check and make the noise go away. But, um, you know, we talk about the compass and my message was, dude, I'm not going to do that. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter what happens to the company or me. You know, it's, there are things that are just going to be non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. And that led to several years of, of uh misery that I didn't have to go through, but it just allowed me to come out stronger every single time. Hmm. I, I just I can ask, how did that turn out? What, just uh, fantastic, and yeah. it always does. Um, I walk around with the belief that the evil in the world wins because the good are too meek to fight. Mm -hmm. And so in my head, I always have this battle between the good and the bad. And I, um, what I've learned is the good is just timid. So I uh, like to be armed <laughs> you know, and be good at the same time. So uh, I, let me go, go back. Is, uh, this, this story you were just telling, does that 
fall under the I won't be taken hostage or I won't work with assholes or both? <laughs> Actually both, right? <laughs> okay. Um, but the I won't work with assholes was tested multiple times. Mm -hmm. You know, you have investors, you have sometimes clients, you know, and, and there's a lot of financial incentives to make arrangements, cut a deal. Mm -hmm. um, and there were a lot of times in my life where it just this principle just made me go, no, I love to say to everyone at Sprinkler that I'm chasing a rainbow. There's something I see that, that we're all going to get to. Um, and what I see a lot of people walk around with is a fence around their dreams, you know, a little boundary they've put. They're afraid to dream. Mm -hmm. they're, they're afraid that, you know, hey, if I dream big, my head is going to hurt. I promise you, your head <laughs> is not going to hurt. You can, you, I think the biggest mistake you can make is put that boundary around your thinking. I'm unapologetically ambitious for my company. I'm unapologetically ambitious about the change that we can bring to the world. I'm unapologetically committed to um, the bigness of our vision. Um, and I want to match it with the boldness of our conviction in getting there. Is that, is that important? Um you know, when you're you're still a small company, yeah, um, to go around and and tell people the bigness of your of your conviction and and talk about um, what that ultimate dream is, or is that too much for people when you're still at a small company? It's too much for people when you're a small company, um, and and people just judge you by your appearances and and the context in which they see you first. Um, but when you have that inner sense of purpose, and you're driven by that purpose, not by uh, an obligation to please others or to look good um, in, a, in a specific context, I think it comes through. I think it's very hard to control it when, mm -hmm. you, when you feel that inside you. When you're small, you actually appear fairly ridiculous making these sort of mm -hmm. big, bold uh, claims and thinking. Um, and in our early days as Sprinkler, we, <laughs> we were um, often ridiculed uh, for our strategy. And there were many, many years that we did not look good because we pursued a platform strategy mm -hmm. um, as opposed to a point solution uh, strategy. And if you go back um, six years, you know, we were going through the world, the business world, the startup world was going through uh, the notion of you got to be really, really specialized and you got to be really um, simple. Mm -hmm. And we just didn't believe in that. We believed that big businesses needed a very comprehensive platform mm -hmm. to interact with their c consumers and customers um, in a very unstructured way. Uh, and so back then it was fashionable to have a link shortening company it was fashionable to have a publishing company in social it was fashionable to have a <coughs> listening company when and, and the conventional wisdom at that time from the pundits was you can't try to do everything mm -hmm. and that's exactly what we did and <laughs> that's what we believed in and i i don't think a lot of people are laughing now when we point out that the world needs an integrated solution and that if these tools are not combined into a single architecture, um, it won't work, at least for the big brands. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, and, and I'm thinking of like people out here who might be like thinking of a, 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 an idea, a company idea. Yeah. Um, it's so much easier to think of that, um, just that tool, right? That, yeah. that one little thing yeah. um, versus, the, versus thinking like I'm going to build a whole platform, yeah. right? So how do you, I mean, if you're, you know, if, if you're one of these folks, right, and you're thinking, yeah. I'm going to start my, you know, company, I'm going to, you know, walk out the door and, and do that. Um, you know, how, how do you think about that distinction between am I just making this tool and what's the future of that versus am I making something that's, you know, that's bigger, that has a place to grow, um, expand into? No, I, I mean, I, I've always thought that wanting to start a company is not a good reason to be an entrepreneur. Because I think the journey is very treacherous and tough and very, very long. It's longer than you think it is always. <laughs> and there are moments that will force you to give up. 
if your intention in starting a company was to create a company because mm -hmm. that can, that box can be checked very quickly i think 99 bucks you can incorporate a company <laughs> um so i think the question is are you, do you really trying to or wanting to start a company or do you see a problem that you want to solve um and if you are driven by chasing a solution to a problem that you see mm -hmm. and that you know of uh the question is not how big your idea is the question is how big is the problem that you're trying to solve perfect yeah and there are two parts to execution at least when you dream big one is to always keep that vision intact as as i talk about to to, to put your head up and every time see that rainbow <laughs> and should be so clear because the world is not going to see it and they're right. going to see it through you every day and and you have to be able to see that and articulate to everyone what it looks like and you have to talk about the promised land and 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 take them on a journey there mm -hmm. but at the same time you got to be able to put your head down and figure out how to close that piece of business right. that day uh -huh. or uh deliver a, a a a piece of software for that weekend or take care of a client problem so it's there's this dichotomy of seeing the big picture mm -hmm. but then blowing yourself to to the day to day execution mm -hmm. and if you lose one or the other i don't think you'll ever end up building anything really big yeah in new york when you walk around sometimes you see those big buildings you know the the 20 story building with a big um banner or advertisement painted on it mm -hmm. right? and that picture is painstakingly painted you know when you look at the guy who's painting it sometimes you'll see this guys up yeah, there right. um and they're literally like you know they have a picture of uh let's say it's a apple advertised and it's the goal with the headphone but what they're painting is uh they play painting a a, a brick with black paint mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying right right so that's how you got to be thinking about building uh something big literally you you got a brick that you're going to play paint black or white <laughs> that day or that week but you see that picture that's a great of way to that goal with the phone in yeah. our hand or the um that that's going to eventually come out when it comes out. Yeah. Well, and and I I don't uh, want to dwell a long time on personality traits, but but there are interesting things here because I think most people don't think of um uh, you know, a successful CEO as somebody who's spiritual, who's nice, you know, yeah. some of these things that you that you are. And there's another word that I think you've described yourself as which I think is actually also really interesting it's naive um, yeah and, and so talk about and you and you see that as a strength that power of that naivety that believe that the good will win is the only way to predictably build big things because if you what you're building is based on hoping that people won't find out mm -hmm. the stuff that goes on behind the curtain i think somewhere along the way you will get exposed let uh, let's go a little to to your journey and kind of get started getting into some of the company stuff. So in your 20s you came to the US. Right. Um and uh and you um you by that point you had a computer science degree so you started working. How did you get from that point to um I'm going to yeah, be I'm going to start a company. So I was working for a a dot com company that was selling DVDs and video over the internet. They tried to do broadband before the bandwidth was quite there. And who was this? Uh, this was called company was called Big Star. Big Star. And at that time, I was there as a consultant building an email marketing system for them. Mm -hmm. Um when Big Star was not going to survive, one of the co-founders um and I and and a couple other people we spun out the email marketing software as a b2b company mm -hmm. and that was literally the transition and i went from trying to build a product um and worrying about engineering to out on the street talking to clients mm -hmm. um and that's where the journey started this is the accidental part of the accident that's part. an accidental completely accidental part and along the way i'm uh, uh i've had so many people be kind to me and so many things that accidentally happened that led to my life i i'm like i'm like a a log that's been drifting i'm just trying to not fail along the way 
And, and, and as wide as the door opened, I've always looked at the light and said, you can do it. And it can be as big or bigger than anyone you've seen. So uh, it, there, there must have been a tra little transition for you mentally at one point, because I'm just thinking you were just talking about how you're not going to you know, really be successful with a company um, unless you really feel passionate about a problem. Yeah. Yet you sort of fell into yeah. um, starting a company. Where, where was it that you got passionate about a problem? What was the problem you saw? When I got started, and, and that's probably why my first business was in too big. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, I fell into it. Um, and along the way, I learned about marketing and digital marketing and this digital transformation. And when I was running Epsilon Interactive, it was arguably the largest email marketing company in the world at that time. And I was exposed to all the big brands and how their campaign management systems worked and their CRM systems worked and their telephone systems worked and their websites worked and their email systems worked with which I'd built one. And that exposed me to this huge problem that I saw coming. Mm -hmm. And the problem I saw coming was the big brands are very siloed. You take any big brand, they typically have five, ten different business units that work independently. Every business unit is sometimes in five to fifty to hundred markets. Right. In every market they got, um, in Brazil, I got someone doing marketing. Mm -hmm. And that team that's doing marketing is going to use email and a website and print and TV. 17 channels. Now you look at the customer that's on the receiving end of that communication, that interaction. Um, every one of these, in every one of those markets, in every department, in every business unit, is going to appear like a disjointed voice to that customer. Mm -hmm. And when social came about and people were connected, it was obvious to me that those disjointed experiences will lead to people being pissed off with brands. And in a world where people are connected, being pissed off at a brand is not a good thing for the brand. <laughs> yeah? It was OK in the past, because you could just buy more advertising against you know, the, the unhappy yeah. people, unhappy people, and just get and they didn't have a it. voice. They didn't, they didn't have, a voice. have a voice. So I, I saw that train wreck happening, or going to happen, and that gave me the conviction that there's a big problem here that someone's got to solve. And that potentially could be the, probably the single biggest enterprise software opportunity that's going to be available in the next 20 years. Mm. So that's where I saw the problem when I got passionate about it. So that was around what year? Um, 2009. Okay, 2009. So Facebook was just really starting to really catch on around 2009. Correct. Facebook, Twitter, they were all around. Um, early success was very clear that they were going to be successful. Now, the reason I knew they, were, they would be successful and widely successful, I didn't know which one was going to be successful because we had the MySpace right, drama right. before that. But I knew one or many of these networking, social networking companies would take off. Um, and I knew that for a fact because I saw the birth and the rise of email. Mm -hmm. So when I got started in the email marketing world, um, brands were using direct mail to communicate. Now, you and I yeah, will remember... Right. Um, 20 years ago, you would come back home every day with this much postal mail. Right. I'll be going through it. There are catalogs. Postal, you throw out. Throw out, yeah. <laughs> so when email came about and consumers started using Hotmail and, and AOL and later Google Mail, um, businesses in the beginning did, did not adopt email. And when I was trying to sell email marketing back then and email marketing software, I've had executives go to me, email's very personal. Like, I don't think consumers would want to get emails from brands. Mm -hmm. And I'm going, look, listen, that's just another way to communicate. Mm -hmm. And consumers are using email, so they would want to get email from you. And there's nothing special about a brand consumer com communication that is way different from a person-to-person -person communication. And no one in the early days accepted that. Yeah. And then I watched the whole industry go from zero to when I left email marketing in 2009, 
98, 99% of businesses were using email as a primary way to communicate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So when social came about, it was clear to me, it just solves the problem I had with commercial email and the same movie is gonna play out again. Yeah, yeah. So that gave me um, the, the, the confidence that, man, this businesses are gonna need, just like they needed email marketing technology, they're gonna need um, social networking communications technology. Mm -hmm. I've always, at least in my life, I've benefited from just stepping back and looking at the big picture and finding patterns. Mm -hmm. And these patterns are what recurs. Um, and if you're able to find a pattern and then go back and do some regression analysis, um, then you're gonna get extreme confidence about what's gonna happen in the future. Mm -hmm. Now these things that happen over five to 10 year period are designed in such a way that a lot of people are gonna be wrong about it, mm -hmm. um, except for the ones that are finding the patterns and doing the regression on it. Because these pundits tend to come in waves and they hype things up and they hype things down. It's like the market cycle. Mm -hmm. um, hey, this company X is the next big thing. You know, two years later, all the same analysts, it's like they, were, they got no shot in hell. This new company <laughs> is the next big thing. Um, and that's because they're, not, they're kind of operating without a foundational sense of these patterns in industries. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and actually, I, I don't want to, we'll get, come back to that in a second, but just to ask one thing about that is, um, don't you find that the venture capitals ap operate that way too? They're just investing in, they invest in lots of the same thing at the same time. Not the good ones. Not the good ones. Not okay. the good ones. Eh? And that's, you can see that very, very um, obviously in, in, in the venture capital world. Um, the good ones, if you look at the ones that have extremely high consistent long-term um, returns over many, many funds, they have cracked the code on finding patterns mm -hmm. and they invest in, um, in, in their, their thesis, I call them thesis-based investors. So how, tell, talk a little bit about how you do it or how you, in your mind you do it. Um, you know, how, do you, how do you do that aggressive analysis? How do you look at what's going on and uh, go back and say, what are the patterns here? Because Everybody, everybody in this room is going to want to do it. Yeah. Well, I have to tell you, I'm a very lucky guy also. <laughs> lucky, uh, I'm likely to be the most lucky guy most people ever meet. <laughs> um, so a lot of things I've touched have, have really become very successful. Um, it's a little known thing. I made an Indian movie. I, was, I ended up producing. I was one of the producers of an Indian movie that went on to become the third biggest box office hit in that oh, language. Really? That was That's my first movie ever. <laughs> um, so I had to answer this question um, in that context a couple of times. Uh -huh. The answer is you take big complicated problems, right? And what you do is you dimensionalize them first. So which, if you, which you mean by? Yeah, so what you that. do is I use what I call as outcome-based thinking. And what, you re what you're really doing is What's the outcome that you're looking to accomplish, mm -hmm. right? In the case of Sprinkler, um, be the SAP for front office. Okay. Be the, the largest company that offers a front office platform for big businesses. Mm -hmm. In the case of movie, you know, hey, you're trying to make sure that critiques and, and consumers love it. Mm -hmm. Then you work backwards. What are the, I'll use the movie example because it's much easier to comprehend than, than business, which is, got a lot more variables. Mm -hmm. um, so what makes a good movie? You know, story, actors, direction, casting, um, editing. So what, now you got six or seven dimensions. Mm -hmm. And what you do, in my mind, I always just go now, put each one of these on a slider scale. Mm -hmm. And I go, how do I mitigate risk on every one of them? <laughs> now you've taken a very complicated problem. Now you've dimensionalized it. And what you're doing is you're mitigating risk. Because end of the day, when you talk about the future, it's all about probability. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to be predictably successful, you can't wing it. You can't hope. Hope is a, <laughs> hope is a fucked up strategy. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there I said that. Um, 
<laughs> not if you want to be predictably successful. And the key is to be predictably successful. Yeah? Yeah. That's the only way you can, you can look someone else in the eye and say, hey, come with me on this journey, and this is why we're going to win. Right. Because otherwise, you can't have that confidence. Um, so when you dimensionalize it, you now take a bigger problem and break it down into smaller activity sets. Um, and you map the outcome to input. Mm -hmm. And by dimensionalizing those and mitigating risk, now it's a much easier thing to solve. Mm -hmm. And then what you do is you, you continuously test things. So in the case of movies, what you do is you start putting the story and the cast together, and then you narrate it to someone and see how they react. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And so then you start shooting and start putting it together and show it to a smaller group of people. Mm -hmm. So and a lot of times, People think, you know, you just kind of bake a cake and give it out to someone, but by testing it as you mix the ingredients, as you move the needle on each one of those, then you increase the probability that the outcome will be predictably successful. Uh -huh. So there's a, that's sort of the science I always apply to any big problem that I want to solve. I'm, I'm, I've been trying to create a culture where, where people can be innovative and people you know, how does a company respond the same way across thousands of people? Mm -hmm. That's a problem that I've been trying to solve at Sprinkler as we've scaled, you know. Uh -huh. we, we had a 12-month period where we hired 700 people. Yeah, you learned some lessons, you, some hard lessons in that first company. Yeah. What were some of the lessons that you learned? Well, um, uh, w what I learned was always to obsess about the fundamentals. And that's a lesson that a lot of people don't get um, because you, you're you almost like, I want to cut the deal. I want to get this one client. There are no shortcuts to predictable success. There isn't one mm -hmm. from what I know. I mean, I'm 43. I'm still looking. If anyone, if you find out a shortcut for predictable success, <laughs> email me. <laughs> I haven't found one. Uh -huh. um, so you always go back to the fundamentals of of building a business and the fundamental idea of building a business small or large is value creation mm -hmm. and there are no shortcuts around it it's not your sales pitch it's not your product you got to start with can I create more value than I need to charge someone to build a business mm -hmm. if you're doing that you as an entity with your idea with your product it's a net, you're a net value creator. Mm -hmm. um, and then you're going to be tested many, many times. You know, people are like, oh, let me just dial up the sales pitch or the marketing um, or scale my product. And you got to keep asking that question mm -hmm. over and over again. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't appreciate the price you have to pay to get experience. Mm -hmm. Who you become is a strict function of what you have gone through. You can learn from success. I, I tell people, success, big success is always like an Indian curry. I'm sure you all, you've all had Indian curry. Um, Indian curry has so many different things that come together perfectly for it to taste good. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard to learn why is it tasty, right? Because every ingredient thinks it's because of that. Mm -hmm. But it's very easy to find out when something goes wrong. Hey, there's too much salt in it. <laughs> right. There's too much pepper in it, right? So that's, that's why it's hard to learn from successes. And failure is something you've got to, you to pay to learn. There's uh, two ways to look at life. Yeah? You can be outcome-focused or you can be activity-focused. And you'll do both. You know, activity leads to outcome. Um, but you are necessarily going to focus on one or the other. Um, and when you start becoming outcome-focused, then the world changes dramatically. And that was just like a light bulb that went for me when I, when I got that advice. And it was unpleasant at that time because I hadn't slept for many, many nights. <laughs> and I wanted credit for working so hard. And, <laughs> and, and, uh, but that just changed my life and my perspective from that point on. Um, if you were a boat on the water or um, in the ocean, you know, there are three kinds of boats, right? Simplifying it. One is uh, like a paddle boat. You're just there, right? And you move along. You don't go too far. Mm -hmm. You're comfortable. You go through life and you die. Uh, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> not very far from where you started, yeah? 
uh, um, but it's good, you know. It, uh, some people are happy that way. Then uh, some are like uh, yachts with, with sails on them. So what happens is these sails, when the wind blows the right way, it goes far. It blows the opposite way. I'm just yeah. pretending you are the boat, so right, you right. topple. Um, and then in